2,500 years ago, a man led one of the most fascinating lives of which we have record. Born to nobility at a time when his nation was on the brink of collapse, he was taken captive when the capital fell. His captors trained him as a government administrator, where he would quickly catch the attention of all those he served under. As his reputation and responsibilities grew, he became a chief counselor to the emperor. He outlived the empire, and as another power rose, extraordinary events led him to continue as a high-level governor for the new empire. The record of his life is an inspiring account of courage, diligence, and poise. Yet for all his remarkable accomplishments and his captivating life story, it is not the account of what he did, but the account of what he saw which most sparks the imagination of those who read the memoirs of Daniel. The predictions he recorded are so thorough and detailed that many scholars have had to adjust their dating for the writing of the book because they cannot fathom the possibility of such detailed accounts of events being given before the events occurred. While some of the prophecies recorded in Daniel have already been fulfilled, many also stretch into a time yet ahead. These prophecies have been the subject of much speculation, but you can know what they reveal about the future of present-day nations. Stay tuned as we explain the meaning of three end-time prophecies from the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is an action-packed account which has greatly influenced Western culture. Common phrases or idioms such as the handwriting on the wall, being thrown into the fire or sent into the lion's den all find their origins in this ancient text. The book begins with the ascent of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar in the year 605 BC. As he returns from the field of battle in Egypt to assume the throne, he stops to sack Jerusalem and in doing so carries away captive the best and brightest Jerusalem has to offer. These young men were then trained to serve in the newly established administration. Along with three close friends, Daniel immediately stood out as a man of extraordinary ability, wisdom, and conviction. The account also highlights that despite being held captive in a foreign land, they held firm to the moral law which they had been taught from birth. They refused to abandon the religious laws which they held dear. Throughout the book, we have several examples of these men remaining faithful despite many obstacles and threats. The text also records several predictions and prophecies of future events. For the purpose of our program today, we'll be examining three of these insightful prophecies. The first prophecy we'll examine came through a dream which troubled the king greatly. It's introduced in the second chapter of Daniel where King Nebuchadnezzar commands those under him to provide the interpretation of the dream. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar ruled over a massive empire, and yet this dream was so troubling to him that he was unable to sleep. He needed an answer, and he was going to ensure that he got results. He recognized that there was nothing stopping those serving him from simply making something up. And so he devised a method to tell whether or not he was being taken for a fool. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. If they could not tell him the contents of his dream, how could he trust them to give an honest interpretation? Their response highlights the difficulty of this challenge. There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Word came to Daniel that he and his friends were to be included among those slated for destruction if this situation was not resolved. What he did next serves as a lesson to us for how biblical prophecies can be understood. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. 
Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Daniel didn't understand the prophecy because he was so much smarter than everyone else. He went before God and God provided the interpretation. When Daniel appeared before Nebuchadnezzar, he reiterated this point to him. He did not point to himself as the key. He informed the king that the interpretation was provided by God. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Daniel revealed that the events pictured in Nebuchadnezzar's dream were not for his time only, but would cover events leading all the way to the latter days, a time which lies yet ahead of us. So what was this great dream which troubled the king so terribly? You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chafe from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel recited the contents of the dream in detail, but this was only a portion of the requirement. He was also required to supply an interpretation. Daniel began by telling Nebuchadnezzar where he fit into this dream. You are this head of gold, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Daniel goes on to describe the feet that were a mixture of iron and clay as a powerful kingdom with ten toes representing ten kings. He then concludes by revealing the meaning behind the stone that was cut without hands. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The dream described four successive kingdoms, starting with that of Babylon. The fourth of these kingdoms is ultimately to be destroyed at the establishment of a fifth kingdom, one that is to endure forever. I'll be back in a moment to discuss the identity of these kingdoms and how the knowledge revealed from this dream was further developed through another dream, this time given to Daniel. Both of these dreams are directly related to further prophetic messages given in another book of the Bible which contains several prophecies the book of Revelation. Be sure to call and request your copy of our free booklet, Revelation, The Mystery Unveiled. You'll be glad that you did. Don't miss out on this exciting opportunity. Call the number on your screen and ask for your free copy of Revelation, The Mystery Unveiled, or order online at twcanada.org. Many dismiss Revelation because they don't know what it means. You can understand Revelation, and we're happy to send you the study guide at no cost because we think it's important that you do. Dial the number on your screen or visit us online to get your free copy. If you missed our contact information this time, keep watching, and I will be back to give it again. Today we are looking at three amazing prophecies anciently recorded by an administrator and governor who served not one, but two powerful empires. These prophecies are found in the Bible, included in the book called Daniel, and reveal vital information about the future of our world. We left off towards the end of Daniel chapter 2. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had been tormented by a vivid and troubling dream. It described four successive empires that would ultimately be destroyed by a fifth kingdom, which would last forever. These great empires are also the focus of our next prophecy, which was also revealed through a dream, this one given to Daniel. The second prophecy from the book of Daniel is recorded in the seventh chapter. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, 
Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. What Daniel had seen is first described in verses 2 through 14. The vision included four successive beasts rising up out of the great sea, a clear reference to the Mediterranean. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. While certainly not ordinary creatures, these first three had enough recognizable features for Daniel to record common animals as reasonable comparisons. The fourth beast was something different, and no animal alive was a suitable comparison. And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different than all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. We'll revisit the horns mentioned here later in the program, but first let's look to the demise of this dreaded beast and the events that immediately follow. I watched till the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. A few verses later, it is confirmed that just as the different elements of the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream foretold four great empires, these beasts were four kings representing four kingdoms. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings to rise out of the earth. Again, we have four successive empires, the last of which is ultimately destroyed at the establishment of a fifth and everlasting kingdom. The parallels between the two are clear. Unless there are two kingdoms which both encompass the entirety of the globe and go on for eternity, the dreams are describing the same thing. We've already seen the identity of this first beast, the lion. It corresponds with the head of gold from the statue, picturing Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian Empire. The Book of Daniel, as well as many additional historical accounts, clearly identify the Medo-Persian Empire as succeeding the Babylonian. One aspect of this event which is fascinating in light of these prophecies is that the Medo-Persian Empire did not just destroy Babylon. It absorbed it into its kingdom and adopted much of its customs and governance. Daniel was alive at the time of this changeover. He understood that Babylon would fall and even warned Babylon's last king of its coming demise. However, that is not the end of Daniel's story. He was given a new position as one of three governors in the new empire and eventually was distinguished as the preeminent among those three. This Medo-Persian empire is our second kingdom. It is represented by the chest and arms of silver as well as the bear with three ribs in its mouth. Remember, Daniel was one of three governors. This new empire had not only enveloped Babylon, but two additional kingdoms as well, Lydia and Egypt. These three are represented by the ribs being consumed by the hungry bear. The remaining kingdoms came to power after the death of Daniel. Our third empire was ruled over by an ambitious Macedonian, Alexander the Great. This kingdom was pictured by the belly and thighs of bronze, as well as the winged leopard with four heads. Alexander's army stretched eastward with such power and speed that he is often remembered as one of the greatest generals to have ever lived. After his death, the kingdom was divided into four competing powers. We have already seen that heads can be representative of kings or even kingdoms. This explains the leopard's four heads. There remains one fourth and final beast, the terrible one for which Daniel had no earthly comparable. The Roman Empire is our fourth kingdom. Its strength and staying power were unlike any other ancient kingdom. The Roman Empire is portrayed as a terrible beast with huge iron teeth and ten horns. It was also portrayed by legs of iron 
and ultimately with feet composed of an unstable mixture of iron and clay. While the visions closely match the historical account, there is one piece of the puzzle that explains why these prophetic dreams are still relevant today. You see, the fourth kingdom was to survive until that time that the stone cut without hands would establish an everlasting kingdom. The fourth beast would be slain at the same time as glory and dominion were given to a new kingdom which could not be destroyed. It is easy to identify this fifth kingdom as the kingdom of God, established at the return of Jesus Christ. But that kingdom hasn't been established on earth yet. If it has, then it's an extraordinarily underwhelming kingdom and doesn't live up to any of the expectations set in Scripture. It's a promise for the future, not something we can see on this earth at the present time. But the fourth kingdom is described as ending when the fifth is established. We don't exactly see Roman legions marching into battle at this time either. So how do these elements fit? Remember those horns Daniel saw on the fourth beast? They hold the key to understanding how this empire has survived throughout history and will once again rear its ugly head on the world. When we return, we'll look at these ten horns and how they relate to another prophecy given later in Daniel and what they mean for you and for me. Daniel was not the only individual given visions of great beasts. Additional visions are recorded in the book of Revelation, and they are best understood when viewed alongside those of Daniel. Neither book is complete without the other, so I encourage you to make the most of this opportunity and request today's free offer, Revelation, the Mystery Unveiled. To request your free copy, call the number displayed on the screen and ask for Revelation, the Mystery Unveiled. You can also order online at TWCanada.org. Have you ever asked, where is the world headed? Or what does the future hold for me? We answer these questions and more in our magazine, Tomorrow's World. It is also yours free of charge. Don't wait. Call or visit us online to get your free copy of Revelation, The Mystery Unveiled, and Tomorrow's World magazine. I hope you enjoy the rest of today's program. We left off in the seventh chapter of Daniel and his dream of four frightening beasts. Those beasts represented the successive empires of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greco-Macedonia, and finally Rome. These same empires were also predicted by a dream given to the king of Babylon. However, in both dreams, it was clear that this fourth empire would still exist at the establishment of a fifth kingdom, which we've identified as the kingdom of God established on earth at the arrival of Jesus Christ. There is an aspect of Daniel's dream from chapter 7 which we have not yet discussed. The fourth beast began with ten horns, another horn smaller than the others, then came along and uprooted three of the first ten. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. There is a lot to unpack in this verse. The ten horns represent ten kings. But the Roman Empire did not split into ten different regional empires similar to the Greeks dividing into four. Yet throughout history we have empires arise in Europe claiming the mantle of Holy Roman Empire. Individuals such as Charlemagne, Otto the Great, Charles V, and Napoleon saw themselves as successors to the Caesars of old. These ten kings described in Daniel 7 do not rule simultaneously. On a previous program titled The Future Restoration of Rome, we examined seven restorations of the Roman Empire, which span from A.D. 525 through a time yet in our future. But we only spoke of seven restorations, seven of the ten kings. What of the other three? The first restoration of Rome that we reviewed in that telecast was under the reign of Justinian. He was the ruler of what is now called the Byzantine Empire, which was the eastern portion of the original Roman Empire. In AD 476, the fall of the Western Roman Empire was complete as the land was overrun by various barbarian tribes and the last emperor was deposed by the barbarian king Odacer. Three of these barbarian tribes in particular were destroyed by Justinian at the behest of the Bishop of Rome, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and the Heruli. These first three horns were plucked out by the little horn. The remaining seven horns all reigned alongside this little horn. 
The first three kings were uprooted due to collusion between the papacy and other military powers. The remaining seven kings all furthered their power through papal support. This identifies not only the ten horns, but also the additional horn with eyes and a mouth. Regarding this little horn, Daniel continues, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. While the little horn referred to the early papacy, it also refers to a false religious leader yet in the future, in a time of great persecution, a tumultuous period of a time and times and half a time. There are several examples in scripture where the phrase time is used to represent a year. If a time is one year, then times could refer to two. Time, one year, and times, two years, and half a time, half a year, adds up to three and one half years. This phrase is used once more towards the very end of the book of Daniel, as part of our third prophecy which we'll be examining, where it describes a time of persecution. That it shall be for a time, times, and half a time, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. This comes at the end of a lengthy prophecy covering the entirety of the 11th and 12th chapters. That prophecy leaps forward in time in verse 40 when it gives a distinct time marker, the time of the end. This is the third prophecy we'll review today. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him. This is part of the lead up to the final demise of the last iteration of the fourth great empire, Rome and all of its restorations. It tells of two power blocks of nations in existence at the time just prior to the establishment of the Kingdom of God. One of these blocks, the King of the South, provokes the other, the King of the North. A thorough examination of prophecies contained in the Bible identifies this King of the North being the last revival of the fourth beast, the feet of iron mixed with clay. A band of nations from north of Jerusalem, in the heart of Europe, which work in conjunction with a great false religious leader. These prophecies are all building towards the same climax. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. This end-time power will conquer the modern nation of Israel. The next chapter describes this as a time unlike any other. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Similar language is used in the book of Revelation, which reveals that this time period will last three and one-half years, as well as in the Olivet Prophecy recorded in the book of Matthew. This is the focal point of Bible prophecy, and the end result is good news. Daniel 12 continues, And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Back in Daniel 7, we read the parallel account of this earth-altering event. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. These three spectacular prophecies given in the book of Daniel record events which would occur from the time it was written, more than 2,500 years ago, until a time that lies still ahead of us. The prophetic dreams of the great statue and four beasts combine to give us an overview of world events, identifying key players in the final portion of the prophecy of the King of the North and of the King of the South. Each of these prophecies benefit from knowledge revealed in the others. Likewise, other prophetic passages in Scripture fill in gaps and provide additional information on these events. In closing, let's review these three prophecies we have touched on today. Dreams given to Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel pictured a great statue and a succession of beasts. The statue's golden head, along with the first beast, a winged lion, pictured the Babylonian Empire. The chest and arms of silver, as well as the great bear, pictured the Medo-Persian Empire. 
The belly and thighs of bronze, and the four-headed leopard represented the Greco-Macedonian Empire, established by Alexander the Great. The legs of iron and the fourth beast, a terrible creature unlike any other, foreshadowed the grandeur and power of Rome. The promise of Rome did not die when the city began its collapse between AD 395 and 476. Ten horns on the head of the fourth beast point to ten kings, three of which were destroyed at the command of an additional little horn. This little horn, a religious leader we've identified with the papacy, would work alongside the remaining seven kings who would rise one after another in seven attempts to revive the Roman dream of a unified European empire. At a time which lies yet ahead, the seventh of these revivals will come to power. Another block of nations will provoke this beast power, which will retaliate with power unlike anything we've seen before. It will sweep through the Middle East and conquer the modern nation of Israel, including the city of Jerusalem. This false religious leader will lead a campaign against the servants of God, but he and the beast power he allies himself with will both be destroyed when the fifth kingdom is established. This fifth kingdom is in no way related to the previous four. It is symbolized by a stone cut without hands. It is not a kingdom created by man, but refers to the kingdom of God, the promised hope for all mankind. There is one more passage from the book of Daniel for your consideration. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. The ultimate understanding of these prophecies was to be sealed until the time of the end, a time when the world would experience an information explosion. These prophecies are part of a series of predictions given throughout the Bible. Each provides additional details or provides greater context to the others. No prophecy and no book of the Bible is complete on its own. The book of Daniel provides tremendous insight, inspiration, and predicts what lies ahead for our world. Please take the time to order your copy of Revelation, The Mystery Unveiled, and see how the prophecies of Revelation build on the prophecies we've described today. And continue to join us each week as Gerald Weston, Stuart Vahovich, and I examine world events through the lens of Scripture and reveal more amazing prophecies about that eternal fifth kingdom, the kingdom of God, which we often describe as tomorrow's world. To learn more about today's topic, visit www.twcanada.org. You can also order by calling us at 1-866-784-7895 or by writing to us at Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 465, London, Ontario, N6P1R1. You will also receive a free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine revealing God's principles for living an abundant and happy life while providing insight into current and future events. At our website, you can also watch this and many more Tomorrow's World programs. Call 1-866-784-7895. Write or visit us online today. This program is a production of the Living Church of God.